Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 214. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code THERAPYCHAT when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today's guest was someone I had been following and hearing about and reading about for years, and a listener asked me to interview them, and I did not think that she would agree, but she did, (laughs) and I'm very grateful that she did. My guest today is Donna Jackson Nakazawa. Donna is an award-winning journalist and internationally recognized speaker whose work explores the intersection of neuroscience, immunology, and human emotion. Her mission is to translate emerging science in ways that help those with chronic conditions find healing. Donna is the author of six books, including her forthcoming book, The Angel and the Assassin, The Tiny Brain Cell That Changed the Course of Medicine, which came out this week just a few days before this episode is going live. Her newest book illuminates the newly understood role of microglia, an elusive type of brain cell capable of Jekyll and Hyde behavior. When triggered, microglia can morph into destroyers and take down synapses, causing depression, anxiety, and Alzheimer's. But under the right circumstances, they can be angelic healers, repairing the brain in ways that can help alleviate symptoms and prevent disease. The Angel and the Assassin elucidates the biological basis behind the mind-body connection and offers us a radically reconceived picture of human health. Donna's other books include Childhood Disrupted, How Your Biography Becomes Your Biology and How You Can Heal, The Last Best Cure, The Autoimmune Epidemic, and Does Anybody Else Look Like Me? A Parent's Guide to Raising Multicultural Children. Her writing has been published in the Washington Post, Health Affairs, Aeon, more parenting, AARP magazine, Glamour, and elsewhere. And she blogs for Psychology Today and HuffPost. That's just a partial list of Donna's many accomplishments, but I am very grateful that she was willing to come here to talk with us about her new book. Knowing that Donna has written about adverse childhood experiences and autoimmune disorders I was definitely wanting to hear what she could share with us today. So I hope you will enjoy our conversation. Let's jump right in. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. My guest today is someone who's done research and writing about autoimmune disease that I think you're going to be fascinated to hear about. My guest is the author of the new book, The Angel and the Assassin, The Tiny Brain Cell That Changed the Course of Medicine. I'm speaking with Donna Jackson Nakazawa. Donna, thanks so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to talk to you, Laura. Yes, I'm so excited that we could make this work. So let's just start off by you telling our listeners about who you are and the work you've been doing. Well, I'm a science journalist, which means that I try to translate work that's coming out from the scientific field into language that really simply put, just helps, I hope, to ease human suffering. I'm the author of six books, including 
the autoimmune epidemic, childhood disrupted. And as of January 21st, um, my sixth book will be coming out, The Angel and the Assassin. So it's exciting title. It's It almost sounds like a spy thriller. <laughs> yeah. Well, writing it kind of was because I was following the story of this very enigmatic cell in the human brain called microglia that we only now in the past five to seven years really understand its function. And the discoveries around this cell as I began to follow the story of its discovery through labs at Harvard and University of Virginia and Mount Sinai Medical Center are really completely changing our understanding of the brain. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing the way the field of neuroscience has changed so much. And it's, it's wonderful. But I'm really wondering, you know, how does this microglia, is the emphasis more on the glia? Well, microglia, yeah, you can say it like that. Microglia are one of four little types of glial cells. But yep, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So how, how does that fit in with health? Well, I think I have to step back a little bit and just explain our understanding of the brain and the immune system. And this has such a profound effect on our understanding of autoimmune disease and the relationship between autoimmune disease and brain related health disorders. And it has a profound, sheds a profound light on our understanding of the relationship between trauma and disorders of the brain. So let's just step back though and frame this that for the past seven years, the fields of medicine and psychiatry have been facing a huge paradigm shift. And that is that over the past century, it's categorically been agreed that the brain was not an immune organ. So any of your listeners who have autoimmune disease know that their body is ruled by their immune system, right? If you have too many environmental hits, whether they're infections or too many stressors or different pathogens or environmental chemicals, these can, in combination, start to trigger shifts in the body's immune response. And that can lead to inflammation and it can lead to autoimmune disease. And that's because little cells in our body called macrophages, which are really white blood cells, they morph and they begin to destroy or inflame healthy tissue. And anyone with autoimmune disease knows how that works and knows that that's really called friendly fire. But it's been believed for a hundred years, and really since the days of Descartes, the philosopher for 300 years, who said 300 years ago, created the philosophy of mind-body dualism, that the brain and the body were functioning as church and state entities, and that the brain was not ruled by the immune system. In fact, the brain was the only organ in the body not ruled by the immune system. But then seven years ago, a series of pretty mind-blowing discoveries in a, in a number of labs turned that completely on its head. And that all comes down to our novel understanding of the form and function of this little cell called microglia. And for since the 1920s, researchers thought that microglia were this tiny cell in the brain, and that's why the micro is in their name, right? They're micro tiny, was just this boring housekeeper cell that carted away dead neurons and catered to the needs of neurons the way an entourage will cater to the needs of a movie, a movie star. <laughs> so researchers just ignored them. They just didn't get the kind of research dollars that neurons got. Neurons were the flashy darlings of the scientific world. Then in 2012, researchers at Harvard discovered that immune cells are not robot like housekeeper cells. They are, in fact, one of the most powerful immune cells in the human body, and they reside in the human brain. And in the same way that white blood cells govern our body's health, 
microglia, the white blood cells of the brain, govern our brain health for good or ill from cradle to grave. So just as I described, autoimmune disease in the body can set in when white blood cells or macrophages detect that something's going off kilter. Again, that could be a plethora of emotional stressors or toxins or infections. In that same way, when microglia, the white blood cells of the brain, are overactivated, when there are too many stressors on them, they morph into big Pac-Man-like cells and they begin to eat away at synapses in the brain. When this research first came out in 2012 at Harvard, researchers could see the belly, the little synapses, material of synapses inside the tiny belly of microglia cells. And this is really fascinating because it solves an age old mystery, which is this. Let's take it back to childhood trauma. We know that in individuals with childhood trauma, and as I wrote in my book, Childhood Disrupted, begin to show a lack of synaptic connectivity in key areas of the brain. And we know that those areas of the brain, when they go down, when those synapses go down, that sets the stage for common brain disorders, including depression, anxiety, cognitive disorders, behavioral disorders, mood disorders, and later in life, Alzheimer's. But it's been a mystery of science as to how it is that those synapses are sculpted away and why they are sculpted away and why synapses go down and the brain goes dark in certain areas as a result of trauma. Why was that happening? Well, microglia, these angels and assassins of the brain, give us that answer because when inflammation is high in the body, or when stressors or traumas cause the body to go into fight, flight, freeze in the face of ongoing threats or chronic unpredictable stress, that causes the immune response to pour out a lot of chemicals and hormones that result in inflammation. We know that. We have millions of studies on this, not millions, but hundreds. And for instance, Yale researchers found that individuals who had experienced a great deal of maltreatment in childhood showed changes to areas in the DNA that oversee the genes that manage the stress response and that these genes were turned on in such a way that it created a plethora of stress hormones in these children's bodies as they were growing up and into adulthood, setting the stage for inflammation and disease across the lifespan. So I have spent years writing about that and lecturing about it, but there has remained this amazing mystery, which is how does that then translate into synapses in the brain going dark and different diseases of the brain being generated? And microglia give us that answer because microglia are functioning as the immune cells of the brain. They are the resident immune cells of the brain. And when an individual is going through a plethora of stressors, and that would include childhood trauma and this enormous burst of inflammatory chemicals are coursing through the body and the body is marinating in inflammatory hormones and chemicals. And this changes the genes that oversee the stress response in ways that keep this cocktail of stress hormones coming. That changes the immune system of the brain in ways that cause microglia to get overactivated And they begin to eat away at synapses. We call this neuroinflammation. Whoa. So neuroinflammation is when synapses are actually being eaten away. By immune cells in the brain. By the microglia. That's right. 
Now, microglia also spit out neurotoxins as they're when they're overexcited and unhappy. <laughs> they also spit out neurotoxins. But this raises a really interesting point, and that is that in the body, we think of neuro we think of inflammation as being red hot, painful, and swollen. Right? That's the clinical definition of inflammation. So this is another part of the reason that for centuries we've missed that the brain can face inflammation and we've missed the true role of these cells. Because imagine this, early anatomists are looking at the brain and comparing it to other parts of the body. And let's say that you are hanging a picture in your house and you hit your thumb and your thumb immediately becomes inflamed. It becomes red. It becomes hot, it becomes painful, it becomes swollen, it swells. Well, anatomists would look at the brain and think, well, this can't be an immune organ because there's a skull, right? And so if the brain were going to swell with what we think of as inflammation in the body, where would it go? Caveat here, and that is that in serious traumatic brain injury, the brain can swell. And that's why, you know, a surgeon has to go in and drill a hole in the skull. But that's very, 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 very rare. In the brain, neuroinflammation is this process by which immune cells begin to oversculpt the brain synapses and connections in important areas of the brain that help us to think and have clarity of mind and feel good and have a good mood state in what we call the connectome of the brain and connections between, say, the amygdala, the fear center of the brain and the hippocampus where we store our memories and process our emotions. Those connections we can see aren't as robust as they need to be. And I'm hoping that in this book, The Angel and the Assassin, I connect the dots in a way that solves this great mystery of medicine, which is why is it in one individual that health who has an autoimmune disease in the body that we'll also see a shift in synaptic connectivity in the brain? And the answer turns out to be kind of scary, and that's because of microglia. But let me also say, this is really great news, because for a long time, the fact that we haven't understood this has held us back in terms of how we look at disorders of the mind. And now that we have this science, we are seeing a paradigm shift, a sea change start to happen in the psychiatry and medicine, which is taking this research into account in pretty exciting ways. I want to talk about one other area of research that is pretty mind-blowing, and that is that in 2016, researchers who I follow in the book as they make these discoveries and tell us the import and the impact of them, at the University of Virginia also discovered something extraordinary, and that is a piece of our anatomy, a part of our anatomy that we never knew existed until literally three years ago. And at the University of Virginia, researchers found that there is a kind of a pipeline, immune vessels that cross from the body and rise up from the body into the area surrounding our brain, technically uh, known as the meningeal spaces. And this means that the brain's immune system, microglia in the brain, and the immune system in the body, what we're always talking about with autoimmune disease and with childhood trauma, the, these two immune systems are in constant conversation. They're really functioning as one system. And when something affects the body's immune system, it also changes the brain's health. And for me as a science journalist, I saw that this extraordinary research wasn't really being covered. And um, I like to just kind of stand on the mountaintop and talk to all the different researchers in a new emerging field and connect those dots and hopefully synthesize for the reader what this means for our understanding of the brain and brain-related disorders and how it might really offer us extraordinary new hope 
for the future of medicine and for patient suffering. Yeah, this is, it sounds hugely, it sounds monumental. It's monumental. Textbooks are being rewritten. I mean, medical schools are rewriting their curriculum based on our understanding of this cell. I mean, to me, it is one of the most paradigm shifting and powerful stories in the history of medicine. And it really promises to alter our understanding of how we can transform human health and repair the brain in ways that we could not previously have dreamt of before this science came, was done. And, and I feel as a science journalist, it's really my responsibility to help close the gap between what is happening in labs and what's happening in the patient clinic. The scientific philosopher Thomas Kuhn famously said, it takes 20 years from the lab bench to the lab coat, you know, in the clinic. And I feel like that's too long. Yeah. I feel like patients really need to know this now. So it reframes our understanding of autoimmune disease in the body, of how childhood trauma not only affects the body, but affects the brain, and, and how we might really get in there and use this science to change how we approach healing. So can I ask you a couple of clarifying questions? Yes, you know, <laughs> and I'm just going to t- tell your listeners an inside baseball thing. And that is that, um, you know, this book comes out on January 21st, 2020. And I probably have a dozen podcasts already that we'll be doing in the next two weeks and many more after that and book tour and all of those good things. And so, but I think it's fun for them to know if it's okay with you. Yeah. You can always cut this later. <laughs> um, it, it's This is the very first time, because you and I are doing this interview now, two months before Book Pub, it's my first time talking about my new book. Wow. So please, please, ladies and gentlemen, please be kind to me if I am finding my way. I spent two and a half years writing, going to labs, being a fly on the wall, reading thousands of research papers writing and revising, uh, fact checking, and all of that. I'm a real paper and pencil girl. I've been doing this for a long time. I work by myself. I'm the one always asking the questions, the researchers and, and individuals I follow and whose stories I tell. So it's my first time answering questions and trying to put this book in verbal terms. Uh, or what we call sound bites in a way that is working for the listener. And so, dear, dear listener, please be gentle with me. I'm finding <laughs> my way. Let's pause for just a minute so I can tell you a little bit more about why I love therapy notes. Hey, it's Laura Reagan. Just wanted to give you a little bit more information about therapy notes. So as you probably know, I run a group trauma therapy practice. I have a total of seven clinicians working with me, and I've been using therapy notes ever since I expanded into a group, which is almost three years ago, well, two and a half. As my practice has grown, therapy notes has been an easy, intuitive practice management system for us to use for billing, scheduling, documentation, and adding staff has been easy. But one of the things I'm really grateful for is the fact that they have a discounted rate for interns. So even my two interns can use therapy notes without it adding a lot of extra expense for the practice since as interns, they don't bring in much, if any, money. So If you're a therapist, whether you are a solo practitioner or a group practice owner, try out Therapy Notes. You can get a two-month free trial by using the code TherapyChat. I think you'll find compared to other practice management systems, it's the best one out there. At least that's what I think. Now let's get back to our episode. Well, so far you're, you're speaking beautifully about this and, you know, this isn't like an attempt to stump you. So if oh, you no. just can't answer or whatever, but I doubt it because really what I wanted to ask is kind of some things to just sort of bring it to 
where those who are listening, whether it's someone who has an autoimmune disorder, which I know many, many of our listeners do, whether general public or therapists, and and for therapists to understand sort of how this relates to who is sitting in their offices with them, I just thought I would ask to clarify a couple things. And one is, I know that you've written about autoimmune and autoimmune disease and childhood trauma for a long time now, and you know that work very, very well. And I know that there's also from, from your books, I know that there's a personal, you know, connection with that for you. I was wondering if maybe you would be willing to talk a little bit about how this information that's new about micro, microglia cells is relates to, you know, an autoimmune disorder like for example, you know, MS or Guillain-Barre. Sure. I don't know if I pronounced that right. but Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guillain-Barre. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, my readers know that between two, 2001 and 2005, I was in and out of a wheelchair and a hos- hospital beds with Guillain-Barre and my case of Guillain-Barre was really confusing to my doctors for two reasons. I got better and then I got much worse and demyelinated a second time and spent six months just learning to put one foot in front of the other. And miraculously, my myelin sheaths repaired, or as my neurologist says, enough for me to live a good life. I'm not going to run a marathon. I can't really run across the street if the traffic light is changing too quickly. But I live a really good life and I do go to physical therapy twice a week and use a combination of many techniques to keep my nerves talking to my muscles. It's not a perfect thing, but I am no longer in a wheelchair. And for that, I am grateful every time I go up the steps because those four and a half years were very difficult. And um, and the other reason my case is unusual is that I also developed a loss of small fiber nerves, which are different from the myelin nerves. So there are a whole lot of things, and those have not repaired completely. And that can also be difficult, leading to different types of neuropathy in the hands, feet, and face. And that's different than Guillain-Barre. I have autoimmune issues with my bone marrow and And I think I'm forgetting a few things, but suffice to say, I know autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is also run in my family. There are several several people in my family who are struggling with autoimmune diseases. And my father died from compilation of autoimmune diseases, including inflammatory bowel and rheumatoid arthritis. So... We take autoimmune disease pretty seriously here. Mm -hmm. Um, And I care that for the years that I've been a science reporter, it has taken so long for, obviously, when I wrote the autoimmune epidemic, for understanding that our body was in this moment-to-moment dance with our environment in ways that could change the function of our immune system for good or ill. And I likened it in that book to what I call the barrel effect. You know, our immune system can handle a lot, but across evolutionary time, as we've put many more things in the environment that tax the immune system, as we deal with a plethora of modern emotional stressors, many different things, chronic unpredictable stressors and toxins in our environment and novel pathogens can combine in ways with our immune system and in a world that is more toxic in terms of chemicals, but also more hygienic in terms of taking away a lot of familiar pathogens that our body used to be familiar with. Our immune system is confused And we seem to be outpacing our ability, our evolutionary ability to keep up with the rapid changes in our environment. And then in Childhood Disrupted, I took that to another level and looked at how chronic unpredictable stressors in childhood can turn on the immune system in negative ways. And so I care that there is this science that shows that these same things are happening in the brain. And 
There are several women in my extended family whom I love and admire deeply who face what we think of as genetic mental health disorders, and they suffer with autoimmune concerns as well. And I, as a writer, will always try to close the gap between the latest neuroscience and what I think patients need to know to find healing and relief. And I I think of these women I love as I write, probably more than I think of my own history. And I thought of those women as I wrote this book. But more broadly speaking, I don't know if your listeners are 50-50 in terms of identifying female, identifying male. But I know from 20 years of lecturing and teaching at universities and workshops and writing books and doing book signings and interviews that women are struck most by these illnesses. And I know statistically that depression and bipolar and autoimmune disease and Alzheimer's strike women at three times the rate of men. And in fact, I have an entire chapter in The Angel and the Assassin where I write about what we know about microglia in light of the female immune system and how this helps our understanding that the female immune system functions slightly differently in response to our environment. And I see this book, The Angel and the Assassin, honestly, from a feminist perspective. I think I see all my work from a feminist perspective, which is not to say that I don't also engage wholly with readers who identify male and and who are incredible supporters of my work. But I do think it's important to note that these disorders strike women at three times the rate of men and boys because the female immune system functions quite differently. We haven't studied that well. Science has ignored that in doing many of their clinical trials. And I guess I'm on a mission to sound a clarion call to change how we view and approach mental health disorders as a society and in medicine for everyone, as I am also conscious that many of those who are suffering are women. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's so frustrating that so many diseases have been researched more from the perspective of men's health and, and, you know, put out there as being for everyone, but it really disregards or omits looking at the differences in women's bodies. And I'm glad you're, you know, I agree with you. And I don't, I think a feminist approach is not just for women, it's for everyone. That's Um, right. And that's right. Yeah. But I agree with you that it's really matters. And especially, you know, and anecdotally, I'm no researcher, but anecdotally, what I see, most people I see with autoimmune disorders are female identifying. It's, you know, your books indicate that it's much more common in women. And, you know, we're all worried about heart attacks and cancer to as things that are going to kill us, but autoimmune disorders are more prevalent for women. That's right. And when we take it into the realm of microglia and neuroinflammation in the brain and individuals living for decades without relief from anxiety disorders and depression and mood disorders. I mean, the medications we have available now work for some patients, but not others. A third of patients don't respond at all. So when we look at that, we look at the prevalence of these disorders in the population and we see that so many are not finding relief, I think the imperative is on us to take this new understanding of the brain and of microglia far and wide and see how it's changing the way in which researchers are looking at possible interventions. So I think, you know, my mission is just to translate the science in a way that puts I think of us our shared humanity on the page and helps to ease human suffering. And throughout the book, I tell lots of stories about the researchers and the patients to help bring the data and the science home 
even for those who might not ordinarily revel in reading about science, because I think about that reader that you just talked about, that woman sitting in her living room who has been suffering with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or thyroiditis or fibromyalgia and who is also facing anxiety or depression and is not getting the help that she or he needs. Yes. Well, I'm grateful for what you're doing. And I know you just listed many, but I'm wondering if you could tell us what microglia, which disorders it really shows up in or how, where it plays a starring role. Great question. You know, in the book, I, I, every time it seemed like, you know, when you're writing a book, there's a saying that, you know, it's like working in the lottery office. Everyone, (laughs) everyone's winning the lottery. You know, when you're writing a book, it seems like everyone is researching and, and, and finding a link to the thing you're reporting on because you're calling all those people and showing up at their labs and being a fly on the wall. So I was mind blown because when I started, I started with visiting and observing in a lab at Harvard, Beth Stevens Lab. And there they were looking at the role of microglia and they published a landmark uh, paper in 2016 in the role of Alzheimer's. And from there, the next goal was to look at the role of microglia in psychiatric disorders. And that took us into the realm of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Others are looking at microglia and showing this microglial overactivation in autism. Others are doing research and showing the link between microglia being overactivated in the brain, like white blood cells in the body and autoimmune disease, in Parkinson's, glaucoma. I have a whole chapter where I was a fly on the wall at shock trauma at the University of Maryland, largely our most successful an important shock trauma center in the country. And at their research center, they're working with microglia in concussion. It turns out that when somebody, a kid is playing soccer and they have a concussion, the thing that determines whether or not their concussion will resolve and be a mild concussion, as opposed to that concussion morphing into what we call post-concussion disorder and becoming an issue for years comes down to, guess what? Microglia. Oh my gosh. Right. And so at Shock Trauma, at Star Research there, they're actually looking at microglia and they're able to measure factors that microglia release in the brain after a concussion. And these factors, aspects of them or uh, parts of them descend or into the bloodstream, and they can be measured. These particles can be measured. And there are so many great, hopeful places where microglial science is taking us. And one of them is that as we begin to learn to measure these levels of microglial activation, and just a caution, that's not ready at your local doctor's office yet. (laughs) There are lots of different things that have to be perfected in clinical trials. But they are using this in, in their research to look at different levels of severity of concussion with the hope that, A, it will help tell someone in a clinical setting this concussion is more serious than we thought. Because, of course, remember, brain does not get red hot, painful, and swollen. Neuroinflammation in the brain is this spitting out of microglial toxins and the loss of synapses. That's different. Hard to see. Can't see it. So, if we can measure these microglial factors in the bloodstream, it tells us not only how serious something is, but whether or not treatments are working, right? So, a clinician would be able to look at these through blood tests, look at microglia, how active they are, how much damage they may be doing, and judge, well, which treatments are we trying here that are working? And that's going to be really mind-blowing in the future. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing to hear about it now. It is. So something that a question that comes to mind for me because of the title of your book, 
you've talked about the destructive effect of microglia. So I get the assassin part, but why is it called angel? And assassin? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> AKA the good news. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was just about to like bring that up because <laughs> it is pretty dark. And, you know, as I was researching it, well, you know, it's true of all my books. If your readers have read all my books, you know that the first third of the book, if you're feeling like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, my God, I had no idea. And you're like, whoa, this is pretty hard to read. This science is a little daunting. Imagine me in my office reading, you know, a thousand papers for one chapter and um, feeling really the same way. And let me tell you what gets me through is knowing that after I've explained these associations and I've explained how this is working in the body, hopefully in a way that the reader can't forget and and ha- gives them a new understanding of their body's relationship and their brain's relationship with the environment and the world in which we live and, and with oneself. It's that I know, I know that I'm going to also take the reader into how this science will save us and, and change medicine over time in a way that will give us a lot new to- a lot of new tools in the toolbox. So toward that end, there is really pretty amazing news emerging in the same way that our understanding of microglia tells us that the brain is really plastic, more plastic than we had thought, responding all the time to the environment around us. It tells us that our brain is more plastic than we thought in positive ways when we bring in positive interventions. I think of it this way, you know, we know we have five senses. We sometimes think of our sixth sense as our proprioception, you know, the way in which we see our body in relationship to space. But we really are thinking about the brain's immune system now as kind of a seventh sense. And that everything that's happening to us, everything that we do for ourselves, every act of self-care, every way in which we work with our diet and therapy and a million other things, that changes our our brain's relationship with the environment around us. So those are, that's just a general way of thinking about this, that our brain is our seventh sense, our brain's immune system. But To be very specific, because I know that as a listener, I want someone to be very specific. I spent, I guess, two thirds of the book following researchers and clinicians as they were implementing treatments that work to help reboot microglia and bring them back to their angelic role. So, Stepping back for a minute, microglia are the angels and assassins of the brain. When they're triggered, they take down synapses. They spit out neurotoxins. But their normal role in the brain, Laura, is to help protect our brain synapses, our millions of neurons, our trillions of synapses in proper form when the brain is healthy and when the brain is, you know, having healthy brain waves and not over triggered by a plethora of environmental stressors, microglia are really like a good doctor. They run around and they imagine them tapping on neurons the way that a doctor taps on your knee to see if you're if your reflexes are working, you know, is everything good here? Great. What do you need? Do you need more of this? Let's give you this. Do you need more of that? Let's give you that. They keep everything working, to use an old-fashioned word, in a super groovy way. And what researchers are finding are ways to bring microglia back to their angelic role so that they can be this good doctor of the brain. Another way of thinking of microglia is they're really the empress of the brain. They are deciding how synapses will connect and how healthy this seventh sense, the brain's immune system, will be. So I followed patients and followed clinicians who are using a whole gamut of ways to reboot microglia and bring them back to what nature intended. And that is to be the good empress of the brain. Well, that's very, very hopeful and very exciting. 
Mm. I think it is. I wouldn't write a book about it if I didn't <laughs> think it was really going to change medicine forever. I can't wait to see what happens and some of the some of the new ways of intervening with I guess with the brain, with the brain's immune system to help heal. I can't wait to see what comes. I'm and so I can't glad. wait to read your book. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yes, January. It's two months away. Well, I guess when your listeners listen to this, it'll be out. That's right. <laughs> so, That's right. By the time they hear this, it'll be for sale. It'll be for sale. And let me just put a pitch in for your local community bookstore. You know, call your local community bookstore and order the book. They'll get it for you. Or go on IndieBound. Wow, I hope this doesn't sound too self-promotional. I'm really not trying to promote the book when I say this. No. I'm trying to promote the old economy. Yeah, so I don't know if your listeners know this, but when I'm doing book signings and so on, we use independent bookstores. And you can find your independent bookstore wherever you are by going to IndieBound.com. Or actually, there is a page on my website, which will take you to IndieBound and put in your zip code. And it will tell you your bookstore and you just click on that, order the book through them. So anyway, I like to support, we, you and I are both from Maryland. I think we didn't tell our readers, our, your listeners yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're both in Maryland right now. Yes. Not in the same room, but not far <laughs> apart. No, and you're very close to where I grew up. So, and I also have a dog coming to sit on my lap if anybody hears that. <laughs> All right, puppy, I see you. And... So we're in Maryland and there's so many great bookstores in Maryland. There's the Annapolis bookstore in Annapolis. There's a very likely bookstore in Westminster. There's the Ivy bookshop and a bird in the hand in Baltimore. And they, all you have to do is click and they'll order that book so fast and get it for you. And so, you know, I have to put in a plug for the great bookstores of the great state of Maryland. Yeah, um, all about supporting independent bookstores. And I did not know about IndieBound.com, so I'm glad you mentioned that. But why don't you tell our listeners where they can find your website, too? Oh, sure. Yes. I'm at DonnaJacksonNakazawa.com. And that is Nakazawa, N-A-K-A-Z-A-W-A. Dot com. So Donna Jackson Nakazawa.com. And I'm under on Facebook. You can join me for discussions at Donna Jackson Nakazawa author at Facebook. And on Twitter, I'm Donna Jack, J A C K, Nak, N A K, Donna Jack Nak. And what else? Instagram, Donna Jackson Nakazawa. And I think that's all the platforms that I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I participate in. So those are easy ways to find me. There's usually some kind of fun discussion going on or you can find out where I'm going to be for book tour. And um, so when this airs, it'll be January, it'll be cold, it'll be snowing. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Donna, thank you so much for being my guest today. And I just want to say about all those um, links and social network places to find you. I'll put all of those in our show notes, but thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I can't wait to share this with everyone when your book comes out in January. I'm really excited and I'm glad you reached out and, um, and thank you. Thank you for taking the time to ask me about this book. I feel like it's really important science. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Donna Jackson Nakazawa. I found it very interesting and I am very curious to check out her book. I hope you liked it too. Please get in touch and let me know what you thought about it. I always love hearing from you. As always, I just want to thank you for listening to Therapy Chat. I'm so grateful to all of you for your support. So until next time, take care. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. There are many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do your billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support, so when you have a question, you can get help fast. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, 
Go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. If you enter promo code therapy chat, they will give you two months to try it out for free. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of therapy chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, therapy chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.